Hoo ha too ha! Welcome, one and all, to Happy Harry's Who Ha Two How To's Three. Nearly said two there, but no, we're on episode three now. And what an episode I have planned for you. What do I have planned for today? Um, oh yeah, looking at characters and animating characters. Okay, we've moved on now from the realm of the bouncing ball and looking only at the arcs and timing and spacing of drawings and things like that. It's time for you guys to begin animating your own characters in whatever medium or program or software that you're using. I know I've said this before, but I'm going to go back and keep reiterating it probably every episode. Um, this hopefully will be useful to you if you're animating with pen and paper or with clay or uh, stop motion puppets made of something else or any uh, program. I'm using Flash and you will learn a few things about Flash along the way I'm sure purely through osmosis and the fact that I'm using Flash but hopefully the things we're going to talk about today will be pretty much universal especially for people doing 2D. So let's jump into it like so here we have the blank page, the mortal enemy of all creative people. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to go throw down the very, very basic rudimentary form for a 2D animated character, almost like an articulated stick man. He's really not much more complicated than that. You can see he has um, sticks for arms and sticks for legs and little blobs for his torso, um, hands, feet and his head. And I'm also going to put in a... Um, cross across the uh, sphere for his head to help me conceptualize that as a sphere and not just as a circle which will help with putting in facial features later on. Now you may well be thinking Harry I can draw a stick man that doesn't help me at all but the application comes into play when we begin animating and here is some sped up footage no I'm afraid it's not real time footage I can't animate that quickly but sped up footage of a shot that I created with this character doing a jump and the great thing is about animating this way is it completely eliminates our preoccupation with drawing. Instead, all we need to concentrate is on the animation itself, the movements. Do they seem realistic or do they have weight? Do they tell the story we want to tell? Is the animation uh, timed out well? Does it flow nicely? Are the arcs in place? And that's before we've even begun to look at the drawing. And every animator I know creates their animation this way beforehand and then goes in later on and embellishes and fleshes out and cleans up those very loose stick man forms. So, ta-da! There we have it. And let's go back and clean up our character from earlier and see what he'd look like embellished and fleshed out. Double ta-da! I've created here a generic village idiot or buffoon type character who has taken the liberty of putting some kind of large rodent down his pants based on our original stickman character. Now this is not a drawing tutorial and I will get to drawing and character design in later episodes but I just wanted to show you guys how we could based on our animation ready stickman um, flesh him out in just a few short stages and create an acceptable looking cartoon character. Uh, as you can see, I started off with our basic stick man and then began to uh, sort of fill him out and put some volume in there and some flesh. And from that, I got our second stage. And really, from then onwards, I was simply tracing the character using Flash's onion skin feature and coming up with nice clean lines. Now, if you don't have Flash and you're using pen and paper, that'll still work. You can place a piece of paper over the top and draw around it or draw over it. Uh, if you're using a light box, that's made even easier, or you can simply go over your original sketches using a pen and clean up the sketches afterwards. Now, I'd quickly like to mention how the amount of detail in your drawings, both in your rough and in your cleanup, is all relative to really what the shot demands of it. For example, if we say here that our screen or our camera lens is uh, the confine of the stage here, and we have a character whose entire body is in shot, but he's not particularly far away, I would still go in and probably add in the hands 
and a sort of torso for the body. I denote the direction the head was looking in. Pretty big head character here. I'd probably go in and throw in a pelvis as well. Oh. And uh, that would probably be all the detail I'd need for a shot that close up before I started to uh, look into the image in a bit more detail and flesh out the pose. Now if we had a really far away shot where the character was weeny 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 small, I wouldn't even um, give him arms and legs, he'd probably just be a dot. That maybe wasn't worth bringing up. But something that I did want to talk about is when we have a character whose face is right up close and filling the screen, you're not going to get away with beginning to animate your shot just using a sphere with a cross. I would from the very get-go start thinking about eyes and nose and uh, their placement so that you have some pretty good anchor points for going in and beginning to embellish that art ready for your final cleanup. This is obviously second stage here. And that brings us to the point where I think finally we're ready to animate a take. Now what is a take, you ask dear old Uncle Harry as he warms his naked body by the fire. Well, a take is simply an acting term for a surprised reaction. Uh, a character seeing something and then reacting to it and then changing their disposition. And honestly, if you end up doing character animation, it's one of those things that you will do time and time and time again, because that's really all stories are. It's characters observing the world around them, changing somehow um, and reacting to it. And I think this is a great introduction to character animation and looking at a few principles that I've yet to introduce without bogging you down with uh, something complicated like a walk cycle, which we will come to in time because it's, a, again, a very sort of fundamental building block for your animation skill set. But uh, I think it's a little bit too sophisticated for us right now. So we're going to look at the take. And I'm going to use for our take the trusty village idiot character that we developed earlier on. He's not much of a character, but damn it, I think he's good enough for what we need him for today. And I'm going to quickly lay in a very basic sort of default expression. The same expression we've seen him strike before. And that's this really kind of totally careless, gormless expression. And I'm not going to give him his hair yet, and you'll see why at the end. Quickly throw in those eyebrows. Okay, now I'm not going to add frame 2 and then frame 3 and frame 4 and frame 5 onwards and onwards like that. That's called straight ahead animation. Instead, what I'm going to do is um, create the key positions or the extreme poses and then place frames in between them. So we're going to go in a kind of odd order, but hopefully you'll keep up with me. Now, the next drawing that I'm going to produce, not the next frame, but the next drawing, is what I will call the down position. And it's our gormless yokel character. Gosh, this is actually really not very PC at all. <laughs> to, uh, to country folk. Um, I'll just call him the buffoon. The buffoon goes down here, and his nose drags as well. His lip drags a little bit too. And this is really just the sort of position that we're going to use before he shoots back up in amazement because he's witnessed something or realized something. And it will really help exaggerate and sell the extreme position of him shooting up, which we're going to do now. When I say shooting up, I mean of him shooting up physically into the air, not doing heroin. Anyway, um, position number three here will be his uh, really shocked expression. And we're going to stretch that head up. Elongate it. Got a bit of squash and stretch going on here. In fact, we'll have that lip drag like it's been pulled up from the down position. And then finally, after that, We'll have our last position, which will be him, again, looking shocked, but a little less shocked um, as things start to sink in. Still, the eyes a little wider than they were before, the head a little bit more elongated. This is the final position, or the final extreme. He's beginning to comprehend whatever this horrible sh 
shocking surprise is that has befallen him. I have no idea, by the way, what that is supposed to be. Perhaps he's realised that there's a new tax on putting possums down your trousers. I have the frames slightly out of order here, so I'll reorder them just quickly and then show you our rough or extreme positions. He goes down, he shoots up into the sky with amazement, then settles back down. Okay, retime that just slightly by adding in frames and uh, dragging out the length of these drawings. Okay, that's about good enough, I think. Now, before I move on to adding in-betweens, I'm going to actually move on to the uh, second stage of roughing out the artwork and improve it a little bit. And the reason that I'm doing that before the in-betweens is so that I'll have nicer artwork to base my in-betweens on. So, uh, this first illustration is pretty good. Um, I'll stick with that, I think, for the time being. And this second illustration, at least add some eye bags there. Um, this second illustration here, um, move this eye down a bit. People using pen and paper may be jealous of the way that I can shift my drawings around and resize them and cut things away quite easily. I'm sorry, but that is just one of the advantages advantages to working digitally. Blimey, doesn't do anything for my mush mouth though. Okay, um, so I'm fairly happy with that as a frame. Um, this one, this one actually I think the mouth should be open. I'll erase some of those construction lines. Um, nose could be a little bit bigger too I think maybe. I needs more bagginess to it. The other ear should be added on. I think two will have the shoulders come up here, just to make this even more different. And finally, his settling position is pretty different to the first one, he's a little bit too narrow here. I'll drag him out, rotate him a little bit. Again, sorry traditional people, but that's just something you can do when you're working with digital. You can be a big cheaty fraud like I'm being. And we'll have that mouth open and put the eye bags back in. But honestly, uh, he's probably good enough there to begin my second stage of roughing out. Now, what you could do is what I've shown you before, where you create a blank frame, turn on your onion skin, and begin to uh, kind of go over the artwork of the frame previous to it. But something that I like to do, which I find very useful, in fact, is by creating a new layer, like I've just done, and see here, when you double-click on the colored square which is uh, unique to each layer you can actually give your uh, layer an entire outline color let's change that to a slightly darker than the background gray and now see it's kind of like by turning this on and off this colored square here which makes it a lot easier to create slightly nicer frames here on the level above. And because we're running out of time today, I'm actually going to skip our second level of uh, roughing up. I think that, roughing up? Cleaning up, rather. Uh, I think I'm going to skip that level and go straight into my final cleanup, just to get you guys the uh, message that I'm trying to get across a little quicker. In fact, why don't we speed things up while I do that to make your lives easier. Okay, and by turning off the uh, rough layer beneath, I can show you my cleaned up extreme frames. They're not the cleanest of cleaned up frames ever, but they're good enough to begin in-betweening. Okay, so when animators talk about producing in-betweens, they're typically referring to either breakdowns or straight in-betweens, and I'll talk about both of those. Here, where we go uh, from the down position to this high position up here. It's quite a radical change. So I'm going to introduce a breakdown here. And what a breakdown is, is a drawing that bridges two together that isn't just a direct placement. For example, if we wanted the head to fall directly between the two drawings, we'd probably put it there and maybe have it sort of slightly stretched, but not as much as it is up here in the extreme position. 
But instead, for my breakdown, I'm going to do something more interesting with it and actually have the head still be low down because it's being dragged by the shoulders, which have come up quite a lot. So it's effectively a way of sort of snapping the character into two parts and having some bits delay and some bits drag. And it creates um, a more interesting effect as the character effectively breaks down. His eyes are still going to be closed here, because again, I still want to sort of favour the position that the head is in, in the down position, despite the fact that the shoulders are, are yanking it upwards. Okay, now that's about as rough as you can possibly do, but I'm going to try and uh, quickly create a polished drawing from that very, very rough in between. I'm flipping back through the frames, again using the more than and less than symbols on your keyboard. And I know they have a mathematical name, but those symbols there. And uh, I'm doing that to make sure that I can stay on model. That's something that people do ask me a lot. They say, oh Harry, how do I get it so that, you know, the arm or the hand that I've drawn looks the same on each frame? And to those people I would reply with probably two pieces of advice. First of all, it's animation. And things can change slightly from frame to frame. It's not the end of the world. Also, people don't tend to notice, especially if the animation is moving a lot. They might not notice. And second, um, you have all your other frames at your disposal. So you can train your eye to identify when there are problems. And by going through your previous frames, and saying, hang on, I drew that nostril that way in this frame, I need to draw it the same way in this frame. That's just an ongoing process, and you'll get better at that the more animation that you produce. Not that I'm keeping my character completely on model here, but I am against it with the time, because I don't want this to drag on for too much longer and get too terribly boring. Okay. So that's my first breakdown. I'm breaking my character down and actually having him move in a more interesting and hopefully less sort of robotic and sterile way than simply placing a drawing directly in between the down and up position. So there's my breakdown. Now, before that, when the head ducks down, we get quite a subtle movement in comparison. He doesn't move down too much. So in that case, I'm just going to throw in a straight in between. And you know what? I don't think I'm even going to do a rough. I might have people frown upon me for acting so recklessly, but honestly, when I have two drawings that are so similar in position, I tend to uh, do the cleanup straight ahead and not worry too much about doing a rough beforehand. If that doesn't work for you, I totally understand that that's completely cool, but for me, that tends to be a time-saving device that doesn't get particularly bad results. So it's something that I use. And this really is a straight in between. You see, I'm almost completely drawing what would really occur if we could program a computer to draw between these two images. Sadly, that's not really achievable at the moment with where technology is. And I would love a computer that could just draw in betweens without them looking like crap. <laughs> um, again, if I wanted a breakdown here, or I wanted to do something first, I could have maybe his head move up before it moves down, or I could have it move to the side before he goes down. I'll do something maybe a little bit more interesting with it. But we have a very functional sort of straight in between here, and that works pretty well. Now, we can already see the movement is beginning to look a lot more fluid just with one breakdown and one in between. And I'm going to add a few more. I've already used the theme tune while playing sped up footage, but I haven't played it backwards. So let's give that a try. Wow, that actually sounded way cooler. Maybe I should do the whole show backwards. Anyway, here we are again with our nearly finished shot. As you can see, I also colored our character in and uh, added about half a dozen in-betweens. Now, 
the eagle-eyed among you may be able to tell that I've also put some of the, these frames as ones and some as twos. I animated it on twos and then went in and played around with it a little bit and made some of them ones when I decided that I needed the motion to be quicker. Now there's one thing left to do which I mentioned earlier and that was his hair. Of course we didn't give the character any hair and he had those wayward strands of hair poking out of um, his skull in the original character design. And the reason that I left those till last is because hair and fabric and fat and certain parts of the body that flop around and fly around are things that you can actually animate after the fact. And now if, if he had a big bouffant hairstyle that was, you know, very much a big part of his character design, I would suggest going in and uh, drawing those in the rough stage. But as he has just one or two strands of hair sticking out, like so, actually let's make that a little thinner, like that, we get the fun job of going in and turning on onion skin, pretty much animating the hair straight ahead, which can be kind of fun. As you can see the root of the hair is really where the most motion is and the tip of the hair is being dragged along and is always about a frame and a half behind. Nearly there. I've added just a few more frames after the character has stopped moving. So I can have that hair spring into place. And let's look at that playback. Yeah, not too bad. We'll be looking at more character animation when I return next week, but before I go, I'll leave you with the eerie knowledge that the first three episodes of my series have all had the exact same length by accident. Bye bye! <laughs>